Hi there. Hi. My name is Shreyash. I'm a PGA3 internal medicine resident. Is it okay if I examine you today? Yes. Uh, today we'll be performing the renal examination. Could I get the vitals, please? So the vitals look like they're stable. So walking into the room, I'm going to assess for any signs of acute respiratory distress, any tripoding and change in position, any person of breathing, accessory muscle use, or anything along those lines that would suggest the patient's unstable. Um, I would also get a general sense of whether they look to be in any distress and get a sense of their body habits. Moving on, uh, as a core part of the renal examination would be the volume status exam. So I would perform all the maneuvers listed as part of the volume status exam, along with a couple of additional factors. Um, I would assess for orientation. So can you tell me where you are right now? Dr. Corbettel's clinic. Okay. And tell me your name? Randy. Okay. And can you tell me the date today? January 19th. Okay. Perfect. Uh, so the patient has learned oriented times three. So around the eyes, I'm looking for any signs of periorbital edema that may be suggested from hypervolemia, or I might be looking for signs of sunken eyes, which might be suggested from hypovolemia. So I'm going to get you to open up your mouth now. I'm going to take a look inside for the mucous membranes. I'm looking for any evidence of dry mucous membranes or tongue furrowing, which I don't see at this time. I would also take a look if I could get you to, open, uh, to lift up your tongue and point it to the roof of your mouth. Yeah, I'm looking for any signs of central cyanosis there, which I don't see. So now moving down, I'm going to take a look at the neck. I would also get assess the JVP, but we'll do this at the end of the examination. But generally, I'm looking for any evidence of of skin furrowing, and I can take a look for skin trigger. This is more useful in a pediatric patient, but I would apply it here as well. Is it okay if I press over here on your skin? So just at the suprasternal notch, and I see that the skin elasticity uh, and trigger is less than two seconds, which is which is reassuring. I would then move on to take a look at your hands. If I could get you to stretch your hands up, and I'm looking for any evidence of of uh, peripheral cyanosis around the nail beds. I don't appreciate anything like that. I would also check capillary refill time. So I'm just going to press on your fingernail here. And I'm looking for a cap refill time less than three seconds, ideally less than two. So moving on with inspection, I would now check the axilla. So I would have the patient appropriately gowned and draped. Could I get you to put your arms out like that? And I'm just going to use a paper towel to feel for any sweat. I'm going to hold there for two seconds and then let go. And I'm making sure that there's no evidence of dry axilla. So you would expect a little bit of sweat blotting over there. And I'll repeat the same thing on the other side. So I'm now going to proceed on to do an examination for evidence of peripheral edema. So looking at the extremities, I would uh, look at both extremities together. But for the purpose of the examination, we're going to focus on the left leg. Um, I would appropriately expose the areas that are going to have dependent edema. And then we'll proceed on to do some pitting testing. Okay, so I'm now going to be pitting along the medial aspect of the tibia. And I don't see any evidence of an indentation to suggest pitting edema. If I did, I would keep proceeding on until I didn't notice any further edema. And then for purposes of volume status examination, I would also examine areas of dependent edema, such as the sacrum. So now we're going to move on to doing a couple more aspects of palpation and the examination. I'll get you to lie down. And I'm just going to raise the head of the bed here to about 30 degrees. Okay, so today we're going to be looking at the JVP. I'll get you to turn your neck to the left for me. Looking for a biphasic occludable, non-palpable waveform in between the two heads of the sternocleidomastoid. I'm going to compare that to the sternal notch. So I see a waveform here at about three centimeters, which if I can compare to the angle of Louis here, I would then correlate this with the ruler. And that comes to approximately three centimeters. Looking at the pulsation, I would also expect it to decrease with inspiration. So now we're going to do the abdominal jugular reflex. So I'm going to press on your abdomen here. And I'm going to hold it here for 10 seconds. I'm looking for a sustained increase in the JVP beyond the 10 second mark. I see here that the JVP has dropped back to three centimeters. And therefore, this is consistent with a normal JVP and a negative abdominal jugular reflex. So for the last part of the volume status exam, I'm now going to move on to auscultation. So I'm going to take a listen with the stethoscope to both your lungs and your heart, if that's okay with you. Yeah. Okay, why don't we start with your lungs? So I'll get you to cross your arms over your shoulder like that. Okay, just to open up your lung spaces. I'll get you to take a deep breath in. Out. 
in, out, out, okay. I'm listening for any adventitious sounds, so I'm listening for normal vesicular breath sounds, um, presence of any crackles that might be suggestive of fluid, um, any wheezes that could also be suggestive of fluid, or any other additional um, breath sounds, which I do not hear at this time. So we're now going to move on to the auscultation of the heart. So I'm going to start with listening to all four spots. I'll listen to the aortic spot here. Can I just feel your pulse here? I'm listening for an S1, S2, which I hear. Any extra heart sounds or any rumors? I'm not able to appreciate them at this time. Now at the second intercostal space over the left upper sternal border, I'm listening to the pulmonic spot. And then moving on to the fourth intercostal space. Or the left lower sternal border. And then the apex. For the mitral spot. So now that I have you laying down, I'm just going to get a drape. I'm going to apply the drape. So I'll just get you to lift up your sweater. Okay, and then we're going to get you to pull down your pants just a little bit. Okay, and now I have a full view of the abdomen. And I'm going to ensure that you're, are you comfortable in this position? Yeah. So, as part of the abdominal exam, I'm going to be looking for a couple of things. I'm going to be looking for any evidence of a scaphoid abdomen that might suggest malnutrition, uh, which I don't see at this point in time. Uh, I'm, I would also be looking for any evidence of ascites. So, clinically, I would be looking for any evidence of bulging flanks. Uh, best place to appreciate this would be at the foot of the bed, so I'm going to stand there. And I don't see any evidence of bulging flanks. So I'm not going to be pressing on your tummy. Let me know if it hurts at all, okay? Mm -hmm. So I move on from the ASS and landmark up. I would use my right hand here to press on the top and my left hand on the bottom of the patient. And I'm going to press down with my right hand to try and block the kidneys. Take a deep breath in for me. And out. I'm going to readjust. I'm feeling for any masses or smooth structure that might be identified as the kidney. I'm not able to palpate the kidneys right now. If I did feel the kidney, I would look for tenderness or any palpable cysts or masses that would otherwise indicate some sort of pathology. I would also repeat this on the other side. So as part of this examination, I'm also going to listen for any renal bruise. So I'm going to identify the abdominal aorta at the bifurcation right above the umbilicus and then move five centimeters up and five centimeters laterally to identify the, the renal arteries. I would then listen with the bell of my stethoscope. And I would do the same thing on the other side. I'm not able to identify any bruises at this time. I would also assess the abdomen to look for any evidence of previous abdominal surgeries um, and also look for any evidence that they might have a peritoneal dialysis catheter. So I'm now going to move on to doing a test to look for any tenderness at the level of the kidneys. So this part might hurt a little bit, but I'm going to apply some, uh, I'm going to apply my hand to release some pressure, okay? Let me know if it hurts a lot. Okay, so I'm now going to move on to the back. I would then identify where the costal vertebral angles would be. So for the costal vertebral angle tenderness, I'm going to apply one hand over here, and I'm going to press down with my other hand. Let me know if this hurts a lot. No. Okay, and so you're applying a firm amount of pressure. I notice that the patient is not jumping off the bed, is not in extreme distress, which is reassuring. It suggests that the test is negative. I would repeat that on the other side as well. Same thing. Okay, using one hand as a buffer. Again, any pain? No. Okay. So the cost of, friend, uh, cost of vertebral angle tenderness is negative. Uh, this is Shirash Dalmia, uh, internal medicine resident PGY3 at McMaster. We just completed uh, going through the renal examination. 
For further information on the volume status examination, the cardiovascular examination, respiratory or abdominal examinations, please refer to our uh, videos below.